Jay, would you please go ahead and introduce yourself and then take it away? Okay, I guess we got all the bugs worked out. So here we go. My name is Jay Wild. <laughs> I'm a rancher from Idaho and a beaver believer. So let's have the next slide. We're located in extreme Southeast Idaho, right there where that arrow is. Where this is in the extreme north end of the Great Basin and the Bear River watershed. Okay, the next slide. Okay, outlined in red there, that's the Bear River or the, the Birch Creek watershed. Uh, our uh, ranch sits right in the mouth of that canyon where that cow is. A mm. uh, cow's trying to figure out why I put it there, but <laughs> anyway, there it is. So anyway, Birch Creek is a tributary to Mink Creek, which is a tributary to the Bear River. Mm. Uh, the ranch borders forest service lands, all those mountains in the background. Can we back up a slide? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, there we go. Okay, all those, all those mountains above the ranch, that's all forest service lands and we have grazing allotment to run our cows there. Uh, this is where I grew up. I grew up in those mountains there. And uh, when I graduated high school, I left the ranch and left, went to college, got married, raised a family, pursued a career. But that land and that lifestyle never got out of my blood. And I, I always really wanted to go back. So in 1995, after my folks passed away, the place was in a, in a fa at family trust. And, and I decided to move back to Birch Creek and I bought out my siblings in the trust and went to work trying to make a ranch out of it. Okay, the next slide. Okay, when I got back after 30 years, I found things were a lot different. Uh, Birch Creek was no longer a perennial stream. Growing up there, we always had flow coming out of the canyon down through the ranch. And it no longer flowed. You can see, I took this photo in 2007 and it was dry on June the 14th. Typically on a, on a average water year, it would be dry the first week in July. Okay, the next slide. I started recording the dates that, that the stream dried up and we come up with this graph and we plotted the days of the year on the vertical axis and, and on the horizontal axis, we plotted precip. So if we know what our, knew what our precip was, we could go to that line and we could predict when the stream would dry up. Okay, next slide. So I, it really bothered me that that stream was drying up and what, what could I do about it? And I tried different things and one thing or another, but one morning in 2006, I was sitting right here at my kitchen table waiting for the caffeine from that first cup of coffee to kick in. And it dawned on me that there were no longer beavers in our watershed. Could it be that, that we needed beavers? And could it be that I was gonna to have to change my mind about beavers? Because I grew up hating them. You know, they were always plugging irrigation ditches and flooding roads, plugging culverts and creating all kinds of havoc. Oh, anyway, the more I learned about beavers, the more I realized that, that we really probably need to have them in these watersheds. Let's have the next slide. 
Well, I went to the Forest Service and most of the watersheds on the Forest Service land. And I went to the Forest Service and approached them about bringing beavers in. And uh, in 2008, I finally got the green light and I brought in six random trapped, live trapped nuisance beavers and released them in one of the small tributaries to, the, to Birch Creek. And anxiously awaited to see a beaver dam, but nothing ever happened. I, you know, there was no sign of a beaver dam or a complex taking taking shape. Well, in two thousand nine, I did it again. I brought in seven more beavers, and the same thing. Nothing happened, and and we don't know whether they just left or whether the predators got them or whether they didn't survive but there was no beaver activity that came as a result. Okay, next slide. So I started researching about uh, relocating beavers and fast forward to 2014. So now we're eight years into my thought that we needed to have beavers. And I was reading an article I mentioned a fellow at Utah State by the name of Joe Wheaton that, that was having success by using BDAs as part of a beaver relocation effort. So I got a hold of Joe. I sent him an email and he answered me right back and he wanted to have him come and have a look. So anyway, next slide. Uh, these guys, uh, Joe talked earlier today about the BRAT, uh, Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool. Uh, it, it'll estimate uh, how many dams the habitat will support. It looks at the hydrology and it also identifies conflicts where there might be problems with infrastructure, roads and bridges and culverts and irrigation diversions. So anyway, the brat looked good for Birch Creek. Next slide. So I set up a meeting with the Forest Service people and had Joe and his buddy uh, Nick Bowers came up and explained to the Forest Service guys just what we were proposing. Uh, the Forest Service folks, they went along with it. They thought, yeah, this is a good idea. Maybe we should try and Try and put some BDAs in and maybe get some beavers to establish in this drainage. Next slide. The whole idea of, of the BDAs is beavers need ponds or deep water. That, that's being able to get in the water to get away from the predators. That's, that's our whole defense mechanism. And if we provide that for them, before we release them, then they're, they're bound to be more comfortable with being able to get, get in the water. It, it's kind of like locking your door before you go to bed at night. You know, it's a security deal, whether they're the bandit out there or not, or in a beaver's case, a predator, he just feels better if he's got that water he can get into. Next slide. So we, uh, we wanted to build a, a pilot and to see, number one, if we could create ponds and whether it would freeze solid, whether those ponds would freeze solid over the winter and if the BDAs would hold up to the spring runoff. So next slide. So those, the pilot, we had temp loggers in there that told us they didn't freeze solid and the BDAs held up to the high flow. So in 2015, 2015 is when we did most of the treatment. And we built uh, five more complexes with 15 BDAs up and down uh, in different areas. Where when you release those beavers, you want to give them choices. They might not like one spot, but chances are they'll find another complex of BDAs where they'll set up shop. Next slide. 
So the fall in October of 2015, we, uh, the Idaho Fish and Game brought us five nuisance beavers and they had been live trapped about 75 miles away. Uh, and we released them in one of the one of the BDA complexes that we built. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. It's it's not moving for me. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, here's our uh, when we released the beavers. We'd actually build a build a lodge for them on the bank of one of those BDA ponds and we released them in there and then we drove sticks in the in the ground in the entrance so they had to chew their way to get out. <laughs> uh, and it, we've already heard about how beavers are a keystone species and you know relative to their abundance have a tremendous effect on all kinds of critters all the way from fish to moose so they're definitely a keystone species. Next slide. In 2016, uh, we hosted a workshop for NRCS folks. And these, these people were from all over the West. They were supervisory people in that agency. And they this, this whole idea was catching on with the NRCS. So they brought these folks in to learn how to build BDAs and learn a little bit about the science that, that goes behind it all. And this photo is pretty special to me. I got uh, that fella there in the front with the cowboy hat on. That's my son. And off to his left in the black sweatshirt, that's his daughter, my granddaughter, Emily. And They've been part of this effort from day one. They, they've been, they've supported me and they worked at these workshops, helped build the BDAs. And that's just really fun for me to see the support I get from my family. Next slide. Oops, here we go. Okay, let's just move on to the next one now. Okay, this is that fun slide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's hope it works. Okay, uh, click it. There we go. <laughs> okay, that's that yellow line that defines the valley bottom, and that's the potential that we can wet with with these BDAs and beaver ponds. Okay, click again. That narrow blue ribbon that was the original stream. Mm. Okay, that's we, the workshop, uh, the, B, the NRCS workshop built four BDAs here. And we actually build them without driving posts. We use, just used natural materials that we found, much like a beaver would. So these BDAs were, were postless. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next slide. Okay, we released some beavers in November or October. Next slide. And they build up, you can see those red lines on, they build up on top of the BDAs that we had in there and actually built three or four other small dams on their own. Okay, the next slide. And it created this those those palms. Okay, the next slide. And this shows the wetted area that, that we've saturated mm -hmm. by those ponds being in there. And this all happened within this all happened within about seven months. So it happened pretty fast. Okay, next slide now. Okay, they stuck around and they utilized 15 of the 19 BDAs that we built in, in 2015, give maintenance and built dams of their own. That picture on the top right there 
we had that BDA in there and the beavers didn't like that spot and downstream about 30 feet, they built a pond of their own and actually flooded out our BDA. <laughs> those, other, those other two photos, those are just natural beaver ponds that they built on their own. There were, there were no BDAs there. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is a, a couple of photos at the, at the photo point on a monitoring site where we do our MIM monitoring for the Forest Service, multiple indicator monitoring. And you can see in 2001, we were in pretty bad shape. So we shifted. It didn't happen until about 2004 when I they elected me president of, president of the Grazing Association. And, and I knew we were in trouble with the Forest Service and I knew we had to shift our management a little bit or quite a bit. So we started keeping the cattle out of this riparian area until late in the season. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't let any cattle in here until after the 1st of September. And you can see by 2015, what a difference that management made. And when we were building all those BDAs in 2015, these guys wanted to put BDAs in here and I wouldn't let them. I told them, I said, no, uh, we've made too much progress there and I don't want to see it flooded. So anyway, next slide. <laughs> well, this is, this is what it looked like the year in 2016. So the beavers, they flooded it anyway. Uh, and that's, it's all good. Uh, we've got the data from since 2001, and it's made it able so we can track the changes in the vegetation. So it's, it's not a lost cause. Next slide. Jay, I just wanted to maybe uh, have you point something out. These two shrubs right here, I think, are these two shrubs here. Yeah. Is that, yeah, yep. Yep. amazing difference. I just, They're willows. One of them's a booth willow on the right, and on the left side, those are uh, Salix lutea, uh, yellow willow. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing. Yeah, this is a drone picture of that, uh, of that meadow during high flows in the spring. The red lines show where the beavers have built dams. But we didn't put any BDAs in that meadow. We had them upstream up where that, where that valley bottom narrows down. But uh, the beavers, they moved into the meadow and you can see how it's flooded that meadow and saturating that water table out into that floodplain. Okay, next slide. So since 2015, we've had a total of nine beaver that we relocated. They've used 22 of 26 of our BDAs and built another 90 dams. And we were counting these dams every year. And you can see the totals, but there's got so many of them, we don't bother to count them anymore. But my, my guess is we've probably got 200 and between 225 and 250 beaver dams now. So oh, it's pretty impressive what the, what those uh, rodents have done. Okay, next slide. They are reproducing our trail cameras. We're getting pictures of kits. There's one that's hitching a ride on an adult. And there's another one out on beyond out in the pond out there. So they are reproducing. We, we have no idea of the population, what we have now. Uh, they're pretty hard to, to get, a, get a count. Uh, you, you're just not going to do it. They're, they're reclusive. They, they're pretty much nocturnal and, and they all look the same. So you wouldn't know whether you've counted the same one once or 10 times. Oh. But but we do have a, an, a, an established population that, that, that is reproducing. Next slide. Okay, this is that graph again. And then those 
those orange dots, that's after we, after the beaver came in. So what we've done is we've extended the, by 42 days the flow coming into the ranch just by the, what the beavers have done. Next slide. Why is that? When we, when we put a dam in a channel and raise that, that pond level up, well, we're actually creating additional storage in the floodplain. And that water that's out there will, will feed the stream through the dry season and uh, help maintain those flows. Okay, the next slide. There's something that ended up being a kind of a byproduct as a result of this, uh, what we've done was the fish response. So we have Bonneville cutthroat trout in Birch Creek and, and they're an isolated population and they're a, they're a pure strain. They've done the DNA on them and they are pure. And they're not listed, but they are considered threatened. But in 2001 and 2012, the Forest Service electrofish and uh, the count they came up with was less than four fish per 100 meters. So we put the beavers in and in 2019, uh, four years later, after we put the beavers in, we did, a, did another electro fishing and, and we found a 153 fish in 100 meters uh, in the beaver complex. And the freeze flowing reaches, we found 19 fish per 100 meters. So the, the fish response has been phenomenal. Next slide. Okay, that's my granddaughter, Emily. And she caught that Bonneville cutthroat trout out of one of the beaver ponds. And the trout that were there before the beaver, you'd be lucky to find one that was six inches long. And this one, he's, he's, he's a foot or better. So anyway, the, the fish response is, like I say, has been a, a byproduct of what our efforts were we were trying to establish perennial flow, but the fish response has been phenomenal. <coughs> Excuse me. Next slide. Okay, if you want to learn about beavers, there's a couple of pretty good books, Saving the Dam by Alan Wall and Eager by Ben Goldfarb. Ben actually visited Birch Creek when he was researching his book, and he talked some about Birch Creek in that book. And if you want to learn about BDAs, how to build them, and all the science behind it, uh, this design manual, it's available on uh, Amazon. Or if you, if you just Google low tech process based restoration, you'll find a PDF version that, that you can download for free. Okay, the next slide. A lot of folks ask me why I come back to the ranch and why I do what I do, but this pretty well spells it out. So that concludes my presentation. I, I'll try and answer whatever questions any of you have. Thank you so much, Jay and Dallas. That was really awesome to, to hear your perspectives and um, just how much you are connected to your land. It's obvious you both are so connected and, and love your land. Um, and so I'm gonna take a look, see if we have some questions. I, usually what happens is they start um, coming on in and just a, it usually takes a minute or so, but I already see a first question. And this would be a question for both of you. So you could take turns in answering this one. Um, are either of you um, neighbor, ran are your neighbor ranchers on board? 
so have have you um had conversations with your neighbors and um your neighbors east west south and north and may, they may be different um you know reactions depending on on where they are so that would be great to hear your perspectives on that dallas do you want to start jackie what i would say is my experience um in a kind way most of the people that i deal with are apathetic at best and it was kind of ironic the day that uh, you were down here and did the eco flight there happened to be a couple ranchers not my next door ranchers, but some I know. And they asked my wife, Brenda, what we were doing. She described to them what we were doing. You know, we're beaver advocates and we're trying to document what we had. And the comment she got from them was, well, if they see a beaver, they drag it out and shoot it. So I guess that's a quick answer to that question. We have some work to do <laughs> to be able to, I don't understand the mindset and I'm trying to get across the benefits. But there is a lot of that out there to work against. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Dallas. Um, Jay. Yeah, well, my experience is a little different. Uh, the folks that have seen what's happened here and they see the extended flows and everything, they're pretty well sold on it. We haven't had an issue with the with the beavers moving downstream and getting down to where they're creating problems for anybody when that happens i don't know what 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 will happen but there's actually been uh, a couple of ranchers that, that are one of them is about four miles south of me here on another stream and he's actually doing the same work he's wanting to get beavers back in on his land and uh, and there's another rancher that's showing interest in doing the same thing. So I think I think the whole idea is kind of catching on. Uh, my experience, once you talk to people that that have doubts and explain to them the, the good that they can do, uh, people will get on board. So it's just a matter of, of getting them educated. Jackie, I might add to that. One thing that we battle here in southeastern Colorado is the Arkansas River is one of the most overappropriated rivers in the United States. Yeah. And water rights are so complex and so critical that anything that happens on a live stream is highly criticized and is judged quickly. But we we do have some strong advocates, and one of them is the area biologist for CPW, Jonathan Wrights. He does an immense amount of work documenting the benefits of beaver. And he actually sent me a thumb drive just the other day that has a thousand pictures of beaver in another area, basically on the Arkansas River. But that that tide is going to change and this group is the, change, the group that's going to change it. Yeah, thanks, Dallas, for, for bringing that up. I um, strongly agree with you. There's just some places that are just way more challenging to work in and gain acceptance of, of beavers. And um, I've seen more uh, good hope coming out of some um, Idaho, uh, other projects that are happening in Idaho and Utah and Montana in particular. And we're getting going here in Colorado. Um, but Dallas, I think you live in one of the toughest <laughs> places to, to gain acceptance um, for, for sure. Um, Jay, have you heard of, um, if there's another great video on YouTube that I found of Idaho work um, happening with a whole bunch of partnerships, I think it's Haley Creek. Are you familiar with, with that project? I think it's Rock Creek. Well, it's up there by Haley. I, okay. I'm a little bit familiar with it, but they're, uh, and those folks, they're interested in uh, the benefits that beavers do. They wet up a riparian area and it'll stop a fire, a wildfire that's coming through. So mm -hmm. that's one of the, one of their targets. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go back to the Q&A here. Um, here's another great question. 
Um, what is your advice for those of us who work with private landowners? What is the most convincing argument for promoting beavers on the landscape? So uh, again, that's a question for, for both of you. Um, like, uh, Jay, I'm gonna start with you this time since you are having better luck <laughs> on getting your neighbors on board. And um, I think you've probably got some great stories to say like, well, was it just bringing them to the ranch and showing them the incredible benefits, but you had to get them there first. So how did you talk about it to get them interested? You know, I, I didn't really go out of my way to recruit help for people. Uh, if somebody was interested, we got them involved with building the BDAs in one thing or another. And if they, if they put some effort into it, then, then they, they actually have ownership in the project. And that word spreads, you know, that's, that's the, uh, it isn't what I say, it's, it's what the people that I talk to, what they say, and I, they, it gets passed on down the line. We, uh, we've been accepted pretty well here. I think in the beginning, they, there were some doubts when they saw us driving posts and building BDAs, you know, what the same hell am people doing? <laughs> uh, you know when they when they see it now and and I'm I'll be riding uh, and come down the road and there'll be somebody parked taking pictures of these beaver dams and and it's you know even someone like that you know if I engage in a conversation with them whether I know them or not I don't it doesn't matter where they're from they could be a tourist of some kind but. They get my viewpoint and most of them will be nodding their head and agreeing with me. So uh, it's just a matter of getting the word out there and, and in some cases explaining the science to them. Well, for instance, um, I'm gonna ask you a follow-up on this. I think you said you became the head of the grazing association for your, your region, your area. Yeah. And when you talk to your fellow ranchers about the why did you do this and, and what the benefits are, you know, um, what what would you say to them? What are some kind of the things that you say that makes them start nodding their heads? <laughs> well, in most cases, the people here have been here their entire life. And, and they remember when the stream was a perennial stream. A lot of them, a lot of guys my age remember catching fish where there's no water now. Mm. And anything we can do to restore that flow, you know, it's, it's, it's just been, I don't know, it's just become really important to me to restore that flow. I don't, it, it's important not only to me and my operation, but what about all the, all the life that depends on that water? I just don't think it's fair that we should throw our hands in the air and say there's nothing we can do and walk away. It, we need to tackle this and, and see if we can get these streams to run again. Thanks. Um, here's another great, great question that kind of gets in the same kind of vein is you mentioned you had a moment where you considered beavers one morning in 2006 as you were sitting there with your coffee and you had this aha light bulb go on and say, gosh, what about beavers? Maybe I should be thinking about them and trying to restore the flows in my stream. Are there any factors or outreach initiatives or other things that made you get that light bulb moment? Was there something that you can remember that you read or, or? You know, I don't, I think, I think of what it was as a process of elimination. I, I, I had a, exhausted every avenue that I could think of to restore this flow. And, and my hands are a bit tied because most of the watershed is on Forest Service land. So, you know, they're not going to let me go up there and do any kind of a uh, 
treatment that I think on my own is, is going to help the flow. Mm -hmm. They're the managers and they got the final say. And I, I will say this, that the beaters in the stream is only one piece to the puzzle. We, there's a lot of other things that need to be addressed as far as management goes. Mm -hmm. And one thing is fire. You know, we haven't had a fire in this watershed for nobody can remember. It's been at least 120 years since we had a fire of any kind. Mm -hmm. Now, you can imagine what what our what our slopes, you know, they're they're getting uh, inundated or encroached on by by junipers. Uh, we've got big tooth maples here that are covering hillsides that used to be open. Most of the the timbered areas has now got shade tolerant uh, species that come underneath that creates another canopy. So. The beavers is one piece of the puzzle, but we haven't solved it yet. <laughs> um, Dallas, I've got one for you. And, um, and then Jay, you can jump in on this one too if you have different thoughts on it. How do um, beaver work within your irrigation ditches? Is, is that an issue for you? How do you avoid or deal with that conflict? Jackie, most of the irrigation in this part of the state, you have to know we are 200 miles from the, the mountains. All of the irrigation water basically in this country is snow melt straight out of the mountains. It comes down the Arkansas River. And Colorado has a winter water storage program to where our irrigation water usually stops in November and begins again 1st of April. So our irrigation ditches, especially the canals and laterals, are dry half of the time. Uh, beaver never attempt to set up in those. If there are any perennial flowing ditches and there are beaver, there are mechanisms in place to, and I've advocated for this, we've done it. If that ever happens to live trap those beaver out of there and relocate them. There is some trapping that goes on, I'm sure, of what people consider nuisance beavers, which is a term that bothers me greatly. But as far as our irrigation ditches, it's just a non-factor because uh, the water is in those ephemerally, and they don't set up, and if they do, they're easily controlled. I did want to say one thing about um, some the rancher mindset. Uh, three weeks ago, we had Car Academies Association on the ranch. We had a big group of people, and they're the progressive ranchers that are working today towards the same things that we talk about. There is a set of ranchers out there that has the same uh, conservation ethics that we have and we were able to show the beaver and the wetlands and what they provide to us and there's huge agreement on that it's just there is like in all groups there's a subset out there that you know thinks that the only thing that should come off of that is what they're trying to raise off of it rather than working in a diverse way but i would say that that is that mindset is definitely changing as far as the irrigation ditches it's really not a factor. If there is a beaver sets up and begins to cause a problem in a culvert or head gate or something, it's it's really, it's not long last and they just don't do much of it because it's so sporadic when there is water in those ditches. The beaver try to set up in the perennial streams where they've always been, where they provide benefit, not detriment. Great, thanks. Those, those are really some great things that you updated us on, thank you. Um, yeah. Jay, Jay, any thoughts you have on that particular question? Well, the, if you if you want to stop the beavers from building dams in your ditches, you need to do away with all the trees and wood and building <laughs> materials. If, if these ditches or ditch banks are maintained like they should be, you know, then they don't have any any building materials. And if if we do have problems, and we did have problems back when I was growing up, and uh, you call a government trapper and he'll uh, live trap them, and, and that'll be the end of it. Is it's usually a single, like a disperser that's out wandering around. You don't see the, the families, you know, it's like Dallas said, these ditches are dry for half of the, sea, half of the year. So, 
you don't see a, a, a major complex where a family will move in and, and disrupt your irrigation. I have, Jay, I've heard that argument all my life. When people want to have something against beaver, they all claim that they're a nuisance in irrigation systems. I have, I've irrigated my whole life. I have never seen a problem that wasn't easily taken care of. It seems like more of an excuse than a legitimate reason. Mm -hmm. Jerry, did you? Jackie, I, I did. Uh, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, Sherry uh, Tippy started Wildlife 2000. And at that time, it was a joke. I mean, the fishing guys, uh, Division of Wildlife guys liked her. She had a nice personality, but that was fun. It was hard to get any ranchers. I was working with the Wilderness Society back then, and they didn't do beaver. But what my point is that that curve is, is compressing very, very much. You can see what happened. And every year exponentially, it gets better on ranch land and on forest. And the next big wave is gonna be on the prairies. Because if those ranchers can understand that better water means better grass, that's the bottom line, like when Dallas started into it. I've been in his place, the grass is just knee high. Uh, he's got cattle all over the place. You go to some of the ranches next to it. It looks like a parking lot. And it's not going to take 40 more years for those folks out there in the prairies in Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico to understand that this is a cash deal. Whether they like beaver or not, they make more money, they got better equity, and they're going to have a better lifestyle. And that's where it's headed. And I think we give it another five, six, seven years. And it's going to be a new world in the prairie land of the of the West. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely trending the the right the right direction. Thank goodness uh, this time around. Um, we have time for one more quick question that I see that's here in the chat box, and then we're going to jump to the next presentation. Um, so this is a question for Jay. Um, Birch Creek flows on average. 42 days longer after the restoration project. Does this mean Birch Creek does go dry some parts of the year? And if it does go dry, what happens with the, the beaver? It does, we do, we do still have a, a stretch that does dry up, but, but there's no beavers activity there. It's just like the dry irrigation canals today. If there isn't any year-round water there, they're not gonna they're not gonna set up shop. So, yeah, we uh, we don't. It hasn't been a problem with them coming on down where the stream is dry. That's that's where we start getting into the deeded property and uh, where there could be conflicts. But and I will say. The Forest Service has gone overboard on this deal. We had one pond that was getting really close to the getting up onto the road. And I asked the Forest Service guy, I said, what are, you, what are we going to do here? And he says, if they get it up on the road, we'll move the road. So <laughs> that tells you that the, maybe the agency, the attitude in the agency maybe is, is, is in our favor. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you to both um, so much. Uh, really was great to have you here today and hear your perspectives and your stories. Uh, so thanks very much.